Hey Exoplaneteers, it's David. So we had a whole bunch of great comments and questions asked about the two Proxima Centauri B videos that we shot last week. So this is going to be a Q&A video responding to some of those questions. First off, let me just say it was great to see so many of you were as excited about this planet discovery as I am. I mean, I really do think this could be one of the most important discoveries made in astronomy in the last 10 years. Okay, so turning to the questions, the first one I'm going to hit is about total locking. Actually, quite a few of you asked about this in the comments. But first off, just let me take a step back and explain what is tidal locking, for those of you that maybe haven't heard of that term before. Well, a good example of tidal locking is the moon relative to the Earth. What it basically means is that the rotation period of the moon is equal to its revolution, its orbital period around the Earth. The consequence of that is that here from Earth, we always see the same side of the moon the near side. We don't ever have access to the far side unless you get in a spacecraft like the Apollo astronauts did and fly around the back of the moon. Because Proxima Centauri is a less luminous star than the Sun, its habitable zone is much much closer and therefore Proxima b, being in the habitable zone, is very close to its star actually. And that means that the planet Proxima b has an increased chance of being tidally locked to the host star. Which, you know, if you think about it, isn't good. You don't really want one side of a planet always facing the star. The classic argument why this might be bad is that, you know, one side would just be a desert and the other side would just be a frozen landscape. In fact, if it got extreme enough, the atmosphere itself could freeze out on the night side of the planet, leading to atmospheric collapse. Okay, that's really bad. That would definitely be a big blow for Proxima b's potential for having life. So to answer the question, is Proxima b tidally locked? We don't know. All we know right now is its orbital period and its minimum mass. That's it. We definitely don't know detailed properties about whether it's tidally locked to its star or not. And it's not guaranteed to happen either. For example, recent work by Jeremy Lecon showed that even a thin atmosphere around a planet can save it from tidal locking. Actually, this might have been the story behind why Venus isn't tidally locked in the solar system. Moreover, even if Proxima b is tidally locked to the star, it's not game over. Once again, even fairly realistic amounts of heat redistribution between the day side of the planet and the night side of the planet can be enough to stop the atmosphere from freezing out. So in that case, yes, this planet's climate would be pretty different from that which we have here on the Earth, but it doesn't mean that life couldn't survive there. It doesn't mean the atmosphere would collapse. Okay, so the next two questions I picked actually kind of lead off from that. So how do we actually learn more about this planet's atmosphere and maybe try and answer some of these questions. So Prime Navigator asks, if Proxima b doesn't transit, does that mean there's no way to get atmosphere data? Patrick Steinmark asks, I wonder what the timetable will be concerning atmosphere detection. So first off, if Proxima b does transit, which actually we still don't know yet, that definitely would be the shortest route, the shortest path to characterizing the planetary atmosphere. Actually, a nice little paper by Laura Kreiberg and Avi Loeb came out just a couple of days ago which discusses the feasibility of one of the alternative methods to infer Proxima b's atmosphere. They propose to use the phase curve method, which is essentially when one observes the amount of light coming off the planet plus the star as the planet goes round in its orbit. So using the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, they predict that they would be able to determine whether Proxima b does or does not have an atmosphere to pretty high confidence. One of the things which could actually screw this whole method up though still is the flare activity of Proxima Centauri. I think this will be one of the big questions going forward is how much does the flare activity impede our ability to potentially characterize the atmosphere of this planet? Okay, so the next two questions I picked are about potentially imaging the surface and features on Proxima b. So Bruce Lee wants to know whether the Hubble Space Telescope could observe the surface of Proxima b for any life and weather activity. I mean, our supposed spy satellites can focus and see an object the size of a grape, so, you know, why can't we do the same thing for Proxima b? And a similar comment, not really a question, by someone who I'm not even going to try and say the name of, wondering if, you know, if, if we could see the oceans and maybe forests on Proxima b. Well, the answer is definitely no, using our current telescopes like SPY satellites or the Hubble Space Telescope. And the simple reason is that Proxima b is a hundred billion times further away from us than a SPY satellite is away from the surface of the Earth. So rather than being able to resolve the size of a grape on the surface of a planet, you now can resolve things a hundred billion times bigger than that, which is about the orbital distance of Proxima away from its star, in fact. And of course, this completely ignores the fact that you now have light from the star Proxima 
to compete with, which is many, many times brighter than the planet itself. So hopefully that gives you a sense as to why even detecting Proxima b with an imaging mission, let alone resolving surface features, is going to be incredibly difficult. And finally, the last question I picked was from David Thais, who asks, Suppose we are able to propel these nanosatellites at 20% the speed of light. When they reach their destination, I mean, how would they slow down? How do you take a picture of a planet when you're traveling 20% the speed of light? So David is referring to Project Starshot, which wants to send a nanosatellite at 20% the speed of light to the Alpha Centauri system. And you're right, there isn't really a plan right now as to how to break and slow down that satellite when it arrives. So I'm playing here a video made by the University of Puerto Rico which is a real-time simulation of what that flyby event would look like at 20% the speed of light. I suspect that even at these high speeds, by combining very short exposure times with some onboard image stacking software, one could create some beautiful images of Proxima b. Actually, probably a more challenging thing is actually how to send that photo back to the Earth. I mean, you actually need quite a large data transmitter to do that. Fortunately, these are nanosatellites, so they're very cheap to make. One could launch thousands, millions of them, and maybe create like a daisy chain relay going all the way back to the Earth. Isn't this an amazing consequence of this discovery? As a result of this, you have serious scientists like myself talking about daisy chaining nanosatellites across light years of space to create images of an alien planet. I mean, I love my job. So before I sign off, let me just also say a huge thank you to everyone who subscribed to the channel so far and all of your really nice comments you put down on our thousand subs video. Thank you so much for watching this video as well. And of course, if you haven't already done it, you know what to do. Click the subscribe button below so you can get all the videos from the Coolworks channel. So until next time, Exoplaneteers, stay curious.